Everyone in the right presentation? Linux 201, choosing the right distro for you. <laughs> or 102? Uh, <laughs> to, 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 to answer the question that I'm sure is going to come up, 101 did not get approved. So uh, we're starting at 102. Yeah, we're starting at 102. Okay. So, Linux 102, choosing the right distro for you. So, here's my disclaimer. Uh, views expressed do not reflect those of the BTC campus or staff of Linux Fest as a whole. I'm a teacher here at BTC, and I also help set up the Fest, but this is just me talking about distros. Uh, the opinions are expressed are just that, opinions. Uh, I am... I guarantee you at least some of you are going to disagree out with me on some of these. If you disagree with my opinions, feel free to talk to me after the lecture and explain why your favorite distro should be in another category. But please don't interrupt the lecture because you think that Hannah Montana Linux is the best distro. <laughs> it's just don't don't shout out if you uh, if you disagree too much. If I say something flat out wrong, please correct me. But uh, other than that. Let's all have some fun. So, let's go over what a distro is. So, most flavors of Linux, at least the ones that I know, uh, typically don't think of a different desktop manager as a different distro. The main exception being Ubuntu with their many flavors of Ubuntu, Kebuntu, Exubuntu, Edubuntu, all those other things. But a distribution, at least to me, is the core difference in philosophy between OS and it's what a certain company or group of people decide to put out and call this their version of Linux. So Microsoft has one distro. It's not my favorite. I can't change any of these dumb looking boxes and squares. You got one option. Same with Mac. You got one. What's up? Could we try turning off the lights? I oh, agree. Sure. And, uh, oh, here. I can pull those down. Yeah. Where's, where's the button? button? There should be a button to turn down those there. blinds. Oh. oh. Yeah. yeah. Could uh, you press that uh, bottom, bottom button line? there? Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's good. Does this system run on Linux? <laughs> uh, it could, possibly. I have no idea what runs these. <laughs> so, <clears throat> OS versus desktop environment. Operating system underlying core of what makes the, the computer the computer. The desktop environment is the graphical layer on top. Some distributions don't make a distinction between the, their OS and a given desktop environment. Some do, or it went into that Ubuntu. The desktop environment we will be getting into. Uh, so this is OpenSUSE, or SUSE. Uh, I need to get my pronunciation, my pronunciation correct. <coughs> so this is OpenSUSE. It's running GNOME Shell. This is also OpenSUSE. This is it running KDE. And they're both the same operating system. Uh, they might not be the same version numbers because I was pulling these off of Google and I'm kind of lazy. But these are popular desktop environments. GNOME, KDE, Unity, well, popular is up to opinion. <laughs> Mate, Cinnamon, XFCE, and LXE are the ones that I chose to go over. They're all pretty different from each other, the possible exception being XFCE and LXDE because they both say, serve a similar purpose. So this is GNOME Shell in its current form. GNOME Shell, two, no, it must have been three or four years, when, underwent a pretty drastic change of how it worked and how it looked. And they have this new app interface. The desktop's very clean. When this goes away, it's just a blank desktop. It automatically creates new workspaces when you go and you create a Anytime you open up a program on a new workspace, it creates another blank one. It's very nice, very clean. I like GNOME a lot, but once again, it's not the distro. You can put GNOME on just about anything you want. This is KDE. This is 
an older version of KDE, but it's still KDE. Uh, KDE is people people say it's pretty Windows like. I can I can see it. I can kind of agree. It's it's a fairly easy one for new people to get into and understand, and it can be really pretty. Uh, it's just sometimes it can get a little slow. Uh, I definitely don't recommend it running on a older system uh, unless you aren't trying to do any of the fancy bells and whistles. This is Unity. Unity is one of the exceptions to, uh, to the you can run it on everything. I'm pretty sure you can put Unity on just about anything. I just don't know why you'd want to. It's designed for Ubuntu by Ubuntu. It's uh, all, all told, it gets a lot of hate. And I don't think it entirely deserves it. It's a clean interface. The, the panel things I could do without, but I typically just install some type of desktop launcher and ignore the fact that the rest of the operating system even exists and use it as a clean workspace. This is Mate. Uh, it's pronounced Mate, not Mate. I, I had to learn that for this. Uh, mate and Cinnamon, which we'll be looking at next, are both reminiscent of the old GNOME interface. When GNOME decided that it was going to go this new direction with GNOME <coughs> Show, they decided that they didn't really like the way that they were going with it and they wanted to fork it. And when you fork something in Linux, it's because it's open source, you can take the source code, you can do whatever you want with it, you can create your own version of it, you can release it under your own name. And that's one of the great things about the, uh, about the industry. You can pretty much do what you want with it. But unfortunately, it leads to a lot of repetition of labor. Uh, this is Cinnamon. It looks almost identical to Mate, except it likes square box or square icons instead of normal icons. That's the main difference that I found between the two of them. And could these two products just coincide and agree on a shape of icons? Yeah. But I mean, it's also kind of beautiful that two people can or two companies can split off and work on their own projects and have the same goal in mind, but go about it in two completely different ways. Now, XFCE is actually one of my favorite desktop environments. I ran it at work for years. That's because it's super lightweight and it doesn't get in the way. Uh, no pretty bells, no pretty whistles, but it does what it needs to. It serves up Windows. And LXD, it's like Xubuntu, it's designed for older systems, ones that don't really have everything set up. You know, the old machine that you're like, I want to throw something on here and mess around with it. LXD is a good choice for that. But it's kind of similar to XFC. They're, they're really two different display managers going towards the same goal. But the main thing that I want you to take away from this is all of those can run on any distro, so don't let the shininess or the prettiness be what distracts you and makes your decision for you. The exception being the many different versions of Ubuntu. If you, wanna, if you want to use KDE on Ubuntu, use Kubuntu. If you want to use XFCE on Ubuntu, use Xubuntu. What's up? Um, is worrying about whether or not these are well maintained uh, all the ones that I went through are pretty well maintained. Uh, XFCE was kind of on the outs for a while because it hadn't been updated in something crazy like five, six years. But they just released a new version two years ago, I think? Uh, a year ago. A year ago. Last time I made that joke. Yep. I mean, is, the, is the desktop a major, or, sorry, the presentation? major issue about security like the actual OS is? Nah, uh, as long as you apply your updates regularly, it should be fine. So, let's move on into distros. So, 
These are the questions I typically ask when I'm trying to figure out what distro is like for, right for me. What am I using Linux for? Am I a student? Am I just playing around? Am I a hobbyist? How long does it need to last? How long do I want this system to just continue on without me having to update, well, not update, upgrade the system, flash it, reinstall it? How long do I want to use the same operating system? Am I the type of person that jumps around to a new distro every week? Or do I want something stable that I can really build on? How much can I deal with change? Some of these distros, you'd have to be right there with the latest version. You gotta keep on updating. And for some people, that's, that's an issue. And some of those, they break stuff and you just gotta, you just gotta roll with it until it gets fixed or write the fix yourself. We're going to be going briefly into the philosophy of freedom. And free as in freedom, not free as in free beer. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to get too deep into that. And do I need it to do my job? And that one was the biggest one for me for the longest time. I was a Linux system man. I was a DevOps lead. And I used Linux every day to get my job done. And I couldn't just use whatever distro I wanted because I needed something stable and firm that I could get work done on. So, these are my recommendations for Linux for people that are new to Linux. Typically, when you're new to Linux, you go one of two ways. You want to install something new every week. For those of you, I don't think you have any problem finding distros. Just try something new every week and you'll eventually figure out what you like. But for the people that want to try Linux and want something that they can live in, these are my recommendations. So, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. It's probably my favorite distro right now. This is it with the uh, KDE theme. It's really stable, and the nice thing about it is it's a rolling release. It, you don't have to go out and get a new version of it. The new version is always brought to you with the regular updates. It's so nice. You could set this up for an elderly parent or somebody that's not tech savvy and just teach them how to do updates and they're good to go for the foreseeable future. You don't have to install new things. You don't have to get them up and running on anything new. And it's a really great Linux operating system with a lot of great ways of doing stuff that you'd normally have to touch the command line to do through the GUI. Most people don't really think of OpenSUSE when they think new operating system for somebody that's fresh to Linux, but I think Tumbleweed's really where it's at. So Ubuntu LTS is one of the typical, this is your operating system. A lot of people, I've seen at least, try to get somebody set up on Ubuntu, but they put them on the latest and greatest, which, I mean, 16.04 is the latest and greatest now, but, Something squeaking out there. <coughs> but anyway, latest and greatest. But the LTS is really what you want for somebody new that doesn't really know what they're doing. Because you know, two years down the road, they get that that message that pops up and says, you know, your distro's out of date, you gotta update. And maybe I'm just the most unlucky person on the planet, but every time I apply one of those, it just bombs my system for a week just absolutely trashes it. And for that reason, I recommend getting the LTS if you can, especially if you're new. And LTS stands for long-term stable, or long-term support, that's it. It's, it's a solid uh, operating system, and since you're coming at new, this is no more weirder to learn than whatever Windows is doing with Windows 10. You're gonna to have to learn a new desktop operating system anyway. Might as well be, might as well be Linux. This one I'm throwing in just because I've heard a lot of great buzz about it. Uh, it's still Ubuntu. It's just the Ubuntu GNOME remix. Uh, really clean, really great, and you don't have all the things that people hate about Unity. So if you really hate Unity, or you have friends that tell you never, never do that then this is the way to go for Ubuntu. And finally, because I have to, Linux Mint. Now this is what everyone was recommending to people who started out new in Linux. 
for years and years and years. Mostly because it came with Flash and a couple other nice uh, quality of life and, uh, changes already installed. And it was working mostly like Windows. I don't, I, it's good. It's a solid operating system. I just don't really see the draw of it. It's, it's very basic when you get into it and you can kind of get trapped in this Linux Mint bubble. Um, though one thing that I do have to say for <coughs> Mint and Ubuntu is you punch something into Google with the error code and your operating system after it and there are hundreds and hundreds of people running into the exact same problem as you with solutions posted. SUSE, you might have to do a little bit more digging, but <coughs> it's getting there. <coughs> so, Linux for work. It's a bit of an abrupt transition, <coughs> but. So, OpenSUSE Leap, and I'm gonna go on about SUSE again, because I'm really loving it lately. OpenSUSE Leap is their new <coughs> release that is aimed at sysadmins, and it is amazing. There's so many tools packed into this. It's stable, you can do your work on it, but you can still do, you still have the benefit of being able to choose when you want to do a major version update. And you can keep it in a stable environment. Uh, YASP is, is fantastic for managing systems. And really, I'm just gonna shut up about it because I've, I've been going on about OpenSUSE for too much. But you should really check out SUSE guys. They're over in Haskell. It's amazing. So Fedora 23. This is one of those distros that it, it's a bit weird. So it's a leading edge distro, meaning that you either update or you fall way behind. And you got to update to the new version when it comes out. But it's the most livable I've found of the Red Hat based OSs. Uh, Red Hat and CentOS are both designed as server distributions, and Fedora is more user focused. It's a good place if your workplace uses CentOS or uses Red Hat and you want something a little bit nicer to use, Fedora would be the way to go, in my opinion. Debian is another one of those, this is one of the grandfather distros. Uh, Debian is what Ubuntu is based on and a bunch of other things, Linux Mint as well. Debian is stable, it's solid, it updates very slowly but it really, really looks at what's going on and makes sure that all of its packages are stable and firm and you won't run into too many issues as long as you're just using it for its intended purpose. Uh, AppGit is very nice and you have the wealth of all of those resources for Ubuntu that translate fairly well to Debian. So Red Hat 7 is actually somewhat livable. And by livable I mean it's not an eye-gouging pain to use. They've been really working on getting their, uh, their desktop operating system up to the level that their server operating system is, and I think it shows in, in this new one, due in large part to GNOME Shell being introduced. Uh, so Red Hat, for those of you who are unaware, is one of the distros that you have to pay for to use. You gotta license it. You can install the operating system for free, but you have to have a license to actually use it well and to get support for it. Um, <coughs> CentOS is the freeware version of it. Uh, it's more or less the same, but the real nice thing about Red Hat, in my opinion, is it's industry standard. Um, if you have a company that can afford it, can afford the licensing, Red Hat will build you a rock, a solid rock to build your infrastructure on. Uh, SUSE as well, but I haven't gotten the chance to play with actual SUSE, just open SUSE. What's up? Sorry, how is Fedora fit into the Red Hat environment? 
Oh, uh, so Fedora is based on Red Hat, uh, but it is almost like a testing distro for it. Uh, they get the latest packages pretty much as soon as they're available and they push them out. And yeah, sometimes that leads to a package being broken or getting an update that makes another functionality fail. But you'd much rather have it fail in Fedora than in uh, Red Hat. So that's where they do most of their testing. They're both uh, Yum. Use, they both use Yum as their package manager, which uh, Yum is, okay, what was it? Yellow Dog Package Manager. Yellow Dog was another uh, fork of Red Hat from way back. And it's still around today, but it's not very popular. But the thing that they made that was really great was their package manager. And a package manager, uh, this is why I wish I had my Linux 101 lecture. So a package manager is what Linux uses to, uh, to go out and get its, op its programs. Uh, package managers are really nice and they lead to less viruses because you get them from a reputable source. You never have to go out and figure out which download link is the real download link. You want to install Firefox, you yum install Firefox or sudo apt git install Firefox. It's, it's the way that computing should be. Verified, trusted sources of data that you can get easily and quickly on your machine. It's, it's beautiful when you think about it. A, a world where users never get viruses because they don't go out to sketchy websites to try and update their Flash because Flash should die. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're getting into the next part. And this is Linux's Linux that feels like work. Uh, which is kind of a joke, but it's really hobbyist Linux. Uh, this is not something that I would ever recommend to a friend as their first time on Linux, unless that friend was the type of person that really wanted to just dive in and see if they sank or swam. Like, these are Linuxes that I've had trouble installing, and I'm fairly, fairly Linux savvy. I, in fact, think so. But these are ones that, by the time you get out the other side and you have a stable desktop and you know everything about it, you're going to know Linux backwards and forwards, at very least as a user. So, Arch Linux. <laughs> I, I know I'm going to get some flack for this because people love Arch. Arch is a good number of people here, as I'm going to guess, their favorite operating system. But it doesn't have that polish or shine of any of the other operating systems, mostly because it gives you the freedom to choose whatever you want to put on it. It's, it's a cool little distro. Uh, it uses a package manager called Pac-Man, which when I first started getting used, getting used to using it, every time I tried to update my system, it just completely destroyed it. But They've gotten better, and the installation process actually teaches you some really interesting parts of Linux while you're just even getting it installed. Yeah, you're going to be sitting there pulling your hair out, especially if this is your first Linux distribution, but you're going to be learning, and it's going to be fun. Uh, I look at these Linuxes not as desktop operating systems, but as like 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> They're great. You, 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 you get them set up the way you like, and then you want to change something, and you break it all, and you have to put it back together. It's fantastic. <coughs> so next up, <coughs> Gen 2. <laughs> which, if you've been on the internet for any amount of time, you've heard the joke, install Gen 2. People would come on forums and ask, hey, I'm having trouble with this certain thing in Windows. And the first response is, install Gen 2. And that is because Gen 2 is about as bare bones as you can get when you first install it. It's, it's nothing, and then you choose every piece of it that you want to make it. It's, once again, it's like a puzzle. And it's fun, and it's 
And it's almost a hobby into itself. The people that install Gen 2, especially when they do it in the beginning, they're a whole different breed of Linux nerd at that point. They're, they're digging in and trying to figure out what makes it actually run. And, you know, there, there always have seemed to be, to me, in the community, a couple of divisions in the groups of Linux people. There's people that want to use it for work and are sysadmins, and then there's people that want to write things for it and are programmers. But I think there's just something fun about the idea of being a, a person and just trying to get in there and dig out and build what is essentially your own custom version of Linux out of Gen 2. And there's only one thing that is cooler than doing that. That's Linux from scratch. Linux from scratch, you build the entire operating system yourself, pretty much. You, you get the kernel. But from there on, it, it's, it, the, the installation procedure is a book. And that book walks you through how to install Linux from scratch. It's, it's really cool. It's one of those things that you can just get into and have fun with. <coughs> you have a question? Is, is that is there a distribution called Linux from scratch or uh, yeah you mean it? yeah there's a well it's not really a distribution because you're building Linux from scratch <laughs> but if you go to linuxfromscratch.org they, they have books on it okay. they have a wiki on it it it's it's a it sort of distribution that is a generic term. yeah no no there's there's actually something called Linux from scratch it's a community that's all about trying to build your own version of Linux. Okay, now we're gonna go into Linux for servers. Uh, since this is a beginning level class, I'll try and keep this one brief. But I know that there's some people here that are trying to set up something like a web server, and they've heard Linux is good for a rock solid web server. And I got two recommendations for that. CentOS, or Red Hat if you wanna pay for the license. But CentOS is a free version of the Red Hat software and it's solid and it's stable and it will last for years. And that's really what you want to look for when you're trying to get a server up and running. Now, I teach here. I also uh, used to uh, work for a company called DIS in town. And we'd get interns in. And when I was interviewing the interns, the question I would ask them is, I'm setting up this server. What distribution would you use? And no fault of my students, but up until that point in the program, all they had really been exposed to was Fedora. So over half of them answered Fedora. And Fedora is a bleeding edge distribution. If you want, if you put it on a server, that's just a nightmare and a half of, of trying to keep it updated and maintained and managed. And you got to keep on updating it. I want something that I can install and just apply updates, and there it is. <coughs> And notice no pretty graphical user interface. That's the other thing I can recommend is if you're going to have a server, have your pretty <coughs> Linux machine that you use as your desktop, and then have the server just be command line. One, it forces you to learn the command line route, and that is very good to have in your knowledge. And second of all, it's, it's way lighter weight. It doesn't take up as much space unless things crash. And then the other one that I'm recommending, uh, Ubuntu Server 16.04 LTS. And the reason why I'm recommending this is because who here has heard of the cloud? So the cloud is other people's computers. And <laughs> since it was designed for, for people to easily jump on and use stuff, a lot of the startups were created by people who were using Linux in some way, and they use Ubuntu as their primary operating system for the most part, because that's what everyone gets recommended to start with, and people tend to circle back to what they first learned. And almost all the startups that I've seen use Ubuntu, hopefully LTS, for their servers, meaning that there's this huge growing wealth of information of how to do stuff explicitly for cloud-based Ubuntu servers. So if you ever want to mess around with the cloud, I highly recommend you do something that isn't Ubuntu. At some point, 
But for starting out, there's nothing easier. It's, it's sad but true that just the, the sheer wealth of all of humanity, well, all of the Linux nerds in humanity, working on problems and posting solutions for this, it's just going to make your life easier. Let's see. So, Rube got quiet. GNU slash Linux. Uh, show of hands, who knows about the controversy about between GNU and Linux, and, or GNU and Linux? Okay, so, looks like I'll have to go over some stuff. So, Linux is an operating system, but it's also the figurehead of a philosophy. And that philosophy is really boiled down to the Linux versus GNU slash Linux debate. Um, so Linux often refers to the operating system, but Linux actually gets its name from the Linux kernel. And a kernel is a translator. Or uh, to put it in business terms, uh, the users or the, the employees of the company are are the hardware. They're what make up the company and make it, and that's the actual company. And then there's the CEOs and the, the top level executives that are making the plans and steering the company. And then you got your, your middle management that communicates between the CEOs and the rest of the company. And that's the kernel. The kernel is that middle layer that, that takes what software wants to do and translates it to things that the hardware can execute. It's, uh, it's one of the most complicated parts to write of any uh, operating system. To give you some example, GNU has been trying to make their own kernel for years mm -hmm. that is fully free and open. And it, I think they have a release that you can download now. But they've been working on it since before Linux came out. Uh, so the GNU operating system with the GNU kernel is called Perf. If you want to check it out, I highly recommend it. But GNU makes up 8 to 13 percent of a typical Linux distribution. Uh, those numbers might be slightly off. And that's far more of the operating system than Linus Torvald contributed. But Linux stuck as a name. And that really sticks in the craw of Richard Salzman who is this huge figure in the Linux community, well, the GNU slash Linux community, and open source software as a whole. The idea that software should be free and that everyone should have the ability to make changes and republish those changes is a huge part of what makes this community work. Uh, we talked about forking earlier, where you don't like something about the way someone's doing their operating system, so you take the source code, you make it your way, and you re-release it. That's amazing. But there's all these other situations that, unfortunately, since we live in the real world where money drives things, there's, there's closed source software inside of Linux. And GNU slash Linux folks, for the most part, I'm generalizing, tend to want a Linux operating system that is completely devoid of non-free software. So GNU is a recursive acronym. I hate those. <laughs> it stands for GNU not Unix. What does GNU actually stand for? GNU not Unix. So what does that one stand for? GNU <laughs> not Unix. And this is why, I, I'm sorry, a lot of you are Linux people, but we should not be allowed to name things. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Hire a marketing team, please. <laughs> so, GNU, strictly speaking, is more of the OS than the Linux kernel is. And it's free as in freedom, not free as in free beer, which is a term that gets thrown around a lot. So I'm going to do my best to explain it as I understand it. Because I haven't really seen that done at Linux Fest. And I don't know. Let's have everyone hate me for a day. <laughs> so, freedom in the eyes of the GNU community and the, and Richard Stallman is the idea, okay. what, what's that? Stallman. 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 Sorry. Thank you. 
Richard Stallman, is the idea that all the code, all the source code for your operating system, for any program that you make, anything that you release, should be given to the world. <coughs> uh, and he created the GPL, or New Public License, to do this. And it's a fairly simple license that boils down mostly to if you make a change to any software that is under the GPL, you also have to re-release that software under the GPL. It's a fairly straightforward, fairly easy to understand idea. But it's a bit idealistic for the way that companies worked or still work. The idea that I worked on this and now I have to give it away to my competitors really does not fly well with certain people. Microsoft, Apple, Google, all of them have proprietary software. Even Ubuntu and OpenSUSE and packages inside of them have uh, OpenSUSE, right? We so ship the distribution as a GPL okay. uh, uh, collective work. So we primarily require GPL. Okay. But you can install non-GPL. You can install non-GPL. Yeah. So, so this, is, this is where the whole freedom debate gets a little bit tricky. Is, what's up? Well, to, but to be fair, to correct it, they, all three of those companies have released open software. Oh, yeah, they, they all release certain things that open, but not their full software platform. And it, we get into a tricky spot. Is it freedom to allow people to install non-free software? Or is that not freedom? And that's really what it comes down to. So in, a, uh, in an attempt to be fair to free software, this is a uh, gotten off of the GNU website. This is a completely free software. Uh, this is one of the ones that earns their, their seal of approval. It's called Nuisance. <laughs> Or good nuisance. I, I never know if I'm supposed to pronounce a hard or soft G for these I things. It's the hard G. Yeah, most of the time it's the hard G. But this is this is an operating system completely devoid of any closed source software. And I believe that it's not possible, or you have to work pretty hard to install closed source software on it. But you can still charge for it. Like, you remake this, you release it under the GPL, and you offer support, you can still charge for that. It's not free as in you have to give away everything that you do for free. It's that you have to let the ideas and the technology and the programming and everything behind it, anyone else can recreate it, but you have to, you have to market it in a different way. You have to sell it based off of your ability to help people with it. Or... Heck, you could sell it just on disks. Like, hey, I got this pre-installed for you. It's easy to go. Sell the disks. That's fine. The GPL does not care if you make money off of it. It cares if you give away the information, if you don't hold on to it and keep that for yourself. Now, that was a bit heavy and a bit philosophical for, a, for an intro-level presentation. So earlier, I mentioned ham on tan legs. And yes, it is a thing. But this is the beauty of Linux. You can, some, somebody, this is a fork of 1204, I believe, uh, KDE. Somebody decided they wanted to make that. And they did it. What's up? Just, just using the word fork. In, in conjunction with that, sounds bad to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <poor guy. laughs> they, they made their own distribution. And yeah, it's awful and pink and Ham Montana's on it. But they made it. And you guys could do that too. You could. You could, you could make, uh, I don't know, Superman. Superman Linux. Come on, another, another version of Linux that you can make that's better than Ham Montana Linux. Batman Linux. Batman Linux. Batman versus Superman yeah. Linux. Oh, Batman versus Hannah Montana. Yeah, Batman versus <laughs> Hannah Montana Linux. That would be interesting. I'd use that one. Barney Linux. 
<laughs> but this <laughs> is one of the both most beautiful and ugly things I've ever seen. <laughs> Just because you don't have to be, <coughs> if all of the Linux distributions I went over today, none of them strike your fancy, none of them are what you want. And believe me, I left a ton out. There's uh, elementary OS, which is like super design heavy and really, really kind of closed source, but it's, it's a cool Linux to mess around with. And then there's Puppy Linux, which is super small. You put it on a thumb drive and just flies away. And then there's, what is it, Nopix? Or Tiny, Nopix. Core Tiny Core Linux, yes. super small, super awesome. There's, there's a million different Linux distributions, and a lot of them are specialized to really cool and interesting you know, applications. Uh, Raspbian for the tiny little Raspberry Pis that are running all the live signs out there. There's a small computer about this big behind all of them running a, a special version of Linux to, to show the signs. So I think fundamentally that open source does tend to be more stable software. It's the right way to do things. Linus Torvalds, who I didn't really talk too much about, but he is the creator of the Linux kernel, and he's a large voice in the community. And by large, I mean both, both People respect him a lot, and he gets loud, loud and yells at people when they do things badly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, open source software. Let, let's go back to that Windows that I showed you earlier. Who here likes Windows 10? One person. One per I have to work with it, so I might as well like it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it sucks less. Yeah, it sucks less than Windows 8. <laughs> but. <laughs> but you've already had to learn something new, so why not you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater and learn an entirely new operating system that when you don't like what they're doing, there's tons of other people that don't like what they're doing, and they, they make their own distro that does what you want. So, remember, there's no one right Linux distribution. Everyone is different. Every Linux is different. <coughs> one size fits all may have worked for years when computers were just used in offices, but now let's use them for life. Figure out what we want to do with them. Thanks. I'm Kevin Berkland. And questions? What's up? Old PCs, you could do something super lightweight like Puppy or uh, Exubuntu I've had good experiences with, and especially with older ones, you have some issues with graphics drivers and other drivers, and I find their uh, additional hardware uh, app super useful for that, especially for new users. Oh, are there any websites that you would recommend that has that have a lot of information on the different distribution? Um, there's DistroWatch, but they don't really go too in depth. Uh, pretty much every tech blog has written an article, though, of the top 10 different versions of Linux and how they yes. how they compare to each other. Yes, and every single one of those articles has different, has different opinions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the great. You get a room full of three Linux nerds and there's six opinions. Yeah. There's also a, a site that is sort of parallel to DistroWatch called Linux Tracker. Oh, that yeah, Linux Tracker is also great. Linux Tracker? Yeah. What's well, up? Um, the Video Revolution OS. Uh, I've not heard of that one. It's oh. really good for um, the history of Linux. OK. Yes, it is extremely good for the Revolution history of Linux. OS. Revolution OS, yes. Mm -hmm. Check it out. I'm going to check that out. Yeah, so I just installed Ubuntu 14, uh, new user. So I, I feel naked because I don't know what to do about security. So how, oh, what, what do I uh, do with security? Well, the, the good news is that most Linux distributions are fairly secure right off the bat. Uh, the main thing that I can recommend to you is keep it updated and check your firewall make sure it's turned on because Ubuntu yeah. has a habit of leaving that turned off. You could also enable Clam if you're worried about this. Basic. Yeah. C C L A M. Yeah. 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 It's a basic Thank antivirus you. for Linux. You don't get too many viruses with Linux, but yeah. There. Um, also, if you go to the Ubuntu site, they explain yeah. about how to turn the firewall. Oh yeah. On, right on the site. Yeah. The, the there, there's it's really simple. There's only a few things you need to do. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a graphical program for doing it as well, so you don't even have to touch the command line. Right.
Though I do recommend getting around to playing with that. What's up? Speaking of firewalls, is there a dis Unix distribution, Linux distribution just to be a firewall? Uh, there are. Uh, personally, I prefer BSD as firewalls. Uh, I'm a big fan of PFSense. Uh, PFSense? My has a free one. What? My has a free one. Okay. Uh, and that's. One, one more time, I didn't quite catch the name of the company. Viata. Viata. Okay. Cool. And you can go to the DistroWatch site and, if, and uh, uh, search on, on Firewall yep. Linux and it'll give you a list of them. Yep. Uh, did you have a question back there? Okay. Uh, what's up? So how does BSD factor into what you would say about the truth? Okay, so BSD, I'm going to say I'm not a huge expert on, but BSD is a, is, was it Berkeley something? Software distribution. Yeah, Berkeley Software Distribution. So it's it's different than Linux. I don't believe it uses the Linux kernel. BSD kernel. BSD kernel. That's the main difference in the operating system. That and BSD is slow moving and stable, as far as I've been able to tell. And tomorrow we start the, 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 the old time on Unix it. hackers that I know don't won't use anything but BSD because they consider it pure Unix mm -hmm. rather than well Linux. Yeah. Pure Unix is... It was worked a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Purer than Linux. Yeah, it, it, I could see that argument. Uh, but you can still get old Unix systems if you really want to annoy Linux people. Uh, SCO still makes their operating system and still license it while they try to sue everyone into the earth. <laughs> is Unix a different kernel than Linux? Uh, yes. So Linux is the free version of the kernel that Unix originally was working on well. Yeah, Linus, Linus wrote the kernel originally for Linux yeah. as, as a training exercise, basically. Yeah. And it took off. Okay. From Unix. Yeah. Who owns Unix? Uh, says AT&T. So AT uh, yeah, I, I don't know who owns Unix currently. Uh, everyone thinks they do. <laughs> uh, there's, a few, there's a few different companies with different places at different levels. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but BSDs. when you get into anything that old with Linux, there's just lawsuits everywhere. Trolls. Well, just a quick one, the uh, virtual Unix boxes since the late 80s. What? Uh, so, uh, you worked on Unix boxes since the late 80s, and there were so many distributions, well, sorry, not the right word, not the distribution, Yeah. but versions. Yeah. Right? There, there, there was like HPUX, um, AIX, um, SCO. Yeah, so there were tons. Uh, but the, the two main flavors were BSD Linux and at and Linux. Okay. There, there's one other thing about the, the thing between Linux and Unix. <coughs> um, the BSD versions, I have the BSD installed, the BSD 10, something. Um, and there's a, there are different operating systems because uh, the, the file system in Linux, you can you can pretty much read any other distribution or or a Windows uh, type of file format. Mm -hmm. In in the BSD that I've got, you can't see a Linux or a yep. or a Windows and, and format. Yeah, the uh, file systems are a big difference between them. Uh, and file systems is a whole other thing. If you want to get into file systems, it's actually super interesting. Uh, there's this new ZFS that's come out that apparently everyone's going to get sued over. It's great. Uh, it, it allows containers a bit more easily. Who is the guy that fooled his wife? Oh. Riser. Riser. Wait, which? What's up? Riser. Who? Dark. The, the, yeah. <laughs> The fellow who designed RiserFS. Oh, okay. He killed his wife? Yeah. Ah, great. Yeah. Uh, on a slightly more somber note, the, uh, the creator of Debian did uh, unfortunately take his life this year, so that's, that's a bit of a bummer news in the Linux community. When you were talking about that last subject, are you talking about the shell, the actual part you can use? No, no, that, that's a whole other thing. So uh, the shell is like the operating system of the command line. Sort of. It's not a great analogy, but it works. Um, so there's a bunch of different shells. Bash is by far the most popular, but most places have their own version of Bash as well. But there's also uh, CSH, ZSH, uh, KSH, uh, just SH. What's up? Got to go back to the Hannah Montana thing. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see that again? 
Would you call it twerking when you're dealing with operating systems? Like uh, I, I thankfully point. never had to deal with that operating system. I just found the picture and put it on. So you can that joke everybody Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for your Thank you guys for coming. Nice job.